Hello and welcome back to the lab. In this video we're going to take a look at one of my calibration plugins, an SG503. This is the first of a couple of videos I'm going to do on the individual plugins that I use to calibrate the scopes and things like that. Just going to kind of service them up, see if there's any caps or anything in there that need that should be replaced due to age or anything like that. I have a second SG-503. This one I've had a part once because when I got it, it had a digit that was dead on the display. So I had to uh, fix one of the readout digits, but it that was just desoldering the readout and putting a new one in. This is the one that I use in most of my uh, calibrations. This one's been giving me a little bit of trouble, uh, so it'll be interesting to take a look at this one. But uh, we'll take a look at this one first. One thing to note with the calibration of an SG-503, unlike the SG-504, the 503 does not have the leveling head, and it will accept any coax cable. This doesn't look special. This is the coax cable that's designed to work with an SG-503. This is a high-quality $20 Amphenel RF cable that's rated up to about 4 gig because it's BNC. The main, the only difference between these two cables is this particular cable, the impedance, the 50 ohm impedance of the cable is very tightly controlled and it's specified to, I believe it's 0.1%. I'm pulling that out of my head so that might be wrong, but I'll confirm that. Um, and so the Input plus the cable makes a matched set. I only have one of these cables, and I use the SG-503 um, with standard BNC cables all the time. The only thing that's different is what the actual voltage says and what makes it to the device. The impedance of the cable can, can do a percent or two of, of difference. Now, in a scope cal, does that matter? Not really, no, because if you're checking bandwidth, you don't really care what the absolute voltage is. You care about six divisions of display. When does it drop to 3 dB? For most applications, is the cable specific and does it matter? Depends on the application. If you need the absolute voltage accuracy out of the SG-503, yes, the cable matters. If you need just the leveling function of having it be the same amplitude over frequency, no, not really, because you don't care what the absolute is, you just care that it stays the same. So your measurements will vary. Do you need this cable? All depends on what you're planning on doing. Well, this kind of looks like a radio. Great big tuning capacitor right here. Kind of looks like a... Uh, and a, an All-American 5. I'm going to zoom in real quick and we'll just take a look at uh, what's going on in here. We have not much of a cam switch from the backside. I'll show you guys here in a minute. But there's two rotary switches. One here, one on the other side of the board over here. Those will be... Um, I'll clean those up and uh, decrud those and get those all serviced up. The tuning capacitor, uh, the grease looks real thick in there, and it looks like it uh, has seen better days. So I'm going to get that all lubricated and all that serviced up, get some instrument oil in there. There's no electrical connection, at least in the bearing over here, and that's really what I'm concerned about, getting that all oiled up. This is the voltage pot. It's just the 10-turn pot, and then the... Uh, range switch. A lot of 74 series logic in here, but we do have tuning coils for the oscillator section. Crystal down here. Some voltage regulating parts. I'm sure there's going to be a voltage adjust probably on the other side. Oh yeah, here's our voltage adjust right here. We have some tantalum caps that may or may not need to be changed. They look okay. There's an RF transistor right here. There's a range switch 
underneath the shield that I will have to pull off and clean. It's that guy right there. So I want to get him all cleaned up. There's a couple of um, the uh, finger switches to take a look at on there. No, that looks about it. Aside from uh, it's not too dusty. I don't see too much junk running around. I'm surprised at how much 74 series logic's in here, though. That's a lot of ICs. Uh, I'll clean up the edge connector. Uh, that's just alcohol on a Q-tip. And we'll go from there. And whatever we end up having to do in here, we will uh, probably have to do twice. Because I got two of these I got to fix. I'll need to desolder this to get in this can, maybe. Unless that's a tab. That may be a tab. I'll have to tell when I take that screw off. I may need to desolder that. Okay. Well, I'll get started cleaning some of these switches up, get everything done, and if anything interesting happens, I'll bring you guys back. I will, when I get this can open, I'll bring you guys back for sure, because I'm kind of curious to see what's underneath there. Okay, I've got the switches exposed here. This is where that cam switch lever was that moved that in and out. I did not need to take um, the peak-to-peak -peak detector board out. You have to be real careful with this board. There's a lot of 50 ohm RF components on this board, this transistor. This is given the uh, circuit substrate, it's going to be a fast and exotic part. This is the actual cam switch itself. If you pop this off, this just has a pin which holds it in the front end of this. You can, you have just enough room to slide it that way and get it out of the enclosure. You have to be incredibly careful though because the the switch fingers are like this so as you're traveling this way you're going against the switch fingers I'll have to be the exact opposite when I'm putting it back in I'll have to push these switches down and then push it forward because um, you don't want to hook one and, and yank it and pull it back so I'm going to get some uh, I'm actually going to try deoxid on here because there's not a lot of room for mechanical mechanical scraping to clean those contacts off so but put a little bit of deoxid, and if you look really closely, there's a hole. Here's a plated through hole that goes down to the other side of the board. That will actually get deoxid on the contacts on the other side of the board, so a tiny, tiny drop of deoxid through there will get that uh, to contact the fingers on the other side of the board. So I do that with a needle applicator. Um, I have a small bottle of deoxid with a needle on it. So I have a um, 465 coming. I've already tried to repair once, one on the channel, and the uh, attenuator ended up having a terminal problem. So if anybody has a 465 parts unit that they don't need an attenuator for, I need one of the attenuators. But uh, I do have another 465B coming that I'm going to do for the channel. Um, it has a similar problem. I'm going to try deoxid on those because uh, the tech manual says only only use isopropyl to clean the switches. But I've run into some situations where isopropyl is just not enough. And I don't think Tech, when they built the 465, thought they were going to have a 50-plus year service life. So, I'm going to try some deoxid on there. I have all the gear to calibrate it, so we'll put some deoxid on the cam switches, test it out, and we'll go from there. But I'll do that all on camera. That'll be a future video. Yeah, so a little bit of deoxid on here, and let's see what happens. Okay, for those of you who aren't familiar with one of these rocker switches, all that happens, really, is... That's it. The little bumps on the bottom side of the plastic move the uh, cam switches up and down. And these detents on the sides are what give you the stops. That's it. That's how they work in the 465 or the 400 series scopes. That's, uh, yeah, I don't think the 7000 series has any of these um, rocker switches in it, but yeah, that's all it is. I've got a little bit of the deoxid still on there, so I'm just cleaning the switches while I'm talking. Just moving them back and forth, getting them to actuate because of that slight rubbing action that the cam switches do. There's three additional cam switches down here that you need to clean. Those are driven by the cam switch, but I did not see uh, evidence of switches on the other side, so... I think those are 
fine unless we discover more problems. All right, I have everything warmed up. So I'm going to do some light calibration on this SG-503. First thing we're going to check is the 22 volt test point, which is here. Wait a second. No, I'm off one. It's here. And we have 22.00 volts, so that doesn't need to be adjusted at all. And so the next supply we have to check is the plus 5.2. Okay, here's the 5.2 test point. We are looking for a voltage between 5 volts and 5.4. We have 5.15, so that is perfect there. Next step is the amplitude setup. Service manual calls for a very complex amplitude measurement using a 7A or a 7A13 and, and a PG506 and a few other things. Part of that is because we set the amplitude at one kilohertz. The SG or the uh, Keithleys, the DMM6500 and the 7510 can both take up to a kilohertz of signal and measure RMS voltage on there. Now I will have to do a calculation because we're setting peak to peak amplitude and their meter is going to give me RMS, but I will, uh, once we know what our target is, I'll adjust the meter and then we'll go from there. Now to get the, the right impedance for the meter, I do. I am using the precision coax into banana jacks with a 50 ohm terminator into the meter. Because without the 50 ohm terminator, we'd be on the. Actually, I think on the on the scales we're going to be using, we'd be at 10 gig ohm input impedance on the meter. So that's way too high. So what we're going to do is we're gonna, we're going to do five volts first. There's 5.0. We'll hook this into the meter. Oh, I need to be on AC for the meter. And we'll pop this in here. Now I need to do some conversions and I'll be right back. Okay, running the numbers, we are looking for a 1.76776 if we can get it that close. So I have a tuning tool. Move this so I can see the adjustments and you guys can see the meter. All right, that's one point five seven six. Wait. Yes, this is set at f 50 kilohertz. Get the best accuracy we can. Take one more reading. Yep, that's pretty stable. Now for the calculation. Okay, we want 0.1. So actually we're a little high, so we need to come down just a touch. Okay, I think I have it adjusted correctly, and it's kind of stabilizing again. I'm going to let the meter run for a little bit and see what's going on. I also need to test the 0.5, but we're looking for 1.767 volts, so we are well within our peak-to-peak. -peak. Okay, so that looks good there. So now I'm going to adjust the 0.5 see what it says because I have the resolution bandwidth real narrow and the um, the filter on it's taking a good while to take some measurements I'm gonna bring that down just a little bit not much okay I want to turn the filter off so we can speed up the measurement 
leave the detector bandwidth short. And this actually needs to come down a bit more. Oh, that looks good. 1767. Let's turn the filter back on. Clear the buffer. 768. Can't really ask for much more than that. I'll get some statistics on that. And then... We will go from there. So after 52 readings, we're doing pretty good. Standard deviations, 14 microvolts, nice and stable. So I'd say we're good there. So we need to check the multiplier now. So what I will do is we'll go down to 0.1. And this should go to 0.0176. Yep, that looks good. Let it get another reading. Let's check the 0 0.01, so that should be 1.76. And that's looking pretty good as well. So the next step is checking the buffer current. And for that, we'll need a spectrum analyzer, which we have in the lab. So I'm going to let that warm up here for a little bit. Didn't realize I needed that for this calibration, so it wasn't turned on with the rest of them. So I'll let that warm up, and then we'll check that. Okay, I've got our spectrum analyzer set up. So I'm testing this on its lowest power, negative 2 dBm at 100 megahertz. If I go next peak to the right... Harmonic is 200 megahertz. We're at negative 58. It's looking for about negative 30. Yeah, 35 dB down is the what the harmonics need to be. So that's good there. I have to crank it up. But I don't want to blow the front end of the spectrum analyzer. It wants to check 5.5 volts, so I'm going to throw a 10x attenuator in there. Okay, 15x was a little bit much attenuation, so I'm going to bring this back up. Actually, 15x is just the right attenuation when you have when you have it on the right frequency. So it's 15x attenuated into the front of the spectrum analyzer. So it's at negative uh, 15 dBm. We're also putting 5.5 volts into the 15x attenuator into the front of the spec an. And then I'm still not used to working in dBm. It's a new world. So if I go next peak right, 54.5, next peak left, 15.3, 15.63, peak to the right, 54, and that gives us a net dBm of 30, 39.1. And we need to be 35, so we are actually good for harmonics coming out of the SG505. Because the next peak is 63, so that's even lower. And it'll continue going on from there. So I also need to check the other frequency range as well. And that is good, actually. on the lower frequency range. Actually, my second harmonic is completely gone. Yeah, because that's 300 megahertz, so the second harmonic is actually gone on the lower range where we're at the Top end, let's check the bottom end of the lower range. There came the second harmonic back. Need to pull out the attenuators. Our harmonics are back. How are they looking? Next peak right.
200. We're at 47. And we're at 2. So that's 45 dB down. So Okay, so that one's fine. And our third harmonic is probably even further down than that. Fifty five. So yeah, that's plenty. So harmonically we're good. Don't need to adjust the uh transistor current. Okay, there is actually a note on the in the calibration manual that says if you don't have to, don't mess with the harmonic adjustments and the coils on the 503 because they're very interdependent and things like that. So tweaking one coil will bring harmonics into another channel and things like that. So it said if you don't have to mess with them, leave them alone. This one's fine. I'm not going to adjust them. The next thing that we have to check, peak to peak detector. Uh, I have one coming. This That one's going to be a while. So this is the last step of the calibration procedure, step seven on this one. So when that gets here, I will pick this up and uh, finish that up. But that uh, all that checks is level flatness. So once that's done, this SG-503 is ready for service. And we can take a look at some of the other ones. Just checking to make sure my uh, measurement was valid with calibrating it with the 7510. So I'm on 2 volts per division. I have the amplitude calibrator set to 4.0. It's actually easier to see this with the envelope detuned. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to detrigger it. And there's the envelope. So that is two divisions of display. So we're about perfect. And it's at 50 kilohertz, so the bandwidth, uh, the 100 meg bandwidth of the scope has no bearing on the measurement whatsoever. So, excellent. Okay, I got everything warmed up and set up. This is going to be a full span sweep, uh, 10 kilohertz bandwidth, and the uh, sweep time is 37 seconds. So we'll hit single sweep. And this is the frequency response up to 1.5 gigahertz of the Tektronix fancy cable. And there we go. Nice and flat, all the way from 9 kilohertz to 1.5 gigahertz. It decreases a little bit, but that's a function of the that's just the cable starts getting lossy at higher frequencies, and BNC is really high, high quality BNC is really only good to about 4 gigahertz. So with this spectrum analyzer, we're about halfway there. But there's that. Okay, I'm ready to check the last step of the SG-503. I've got the precision BNC cable hooked up to the peak-to-peak -peak de detector. I've got this contraption that they wanted me to build, which is the positive and negative with a 2.4 mega ohm resistor between the two coming out into the DMM-7510. I'll move over to that here in a second. I have... Everything dialed in pretty good. Now I just have to sweep the ranges and make sure. Okay, so to check the flatness up to between 50 megahertz and 100 megahertz, I've got everything set up. I'm actually going to change the meter a little bit to make this easier because we're going to go relative measurements. All right, let me move over to the meter and I'll show you what I've done. Okay, so I need to take a baseline reading at 50 kilohertz, which we've done. I'll clear the active buffer. That's now set to 1. And let's 
and we'll leave it fast. So the way I've got the meter set up is no filter, 10 power line cycles. Uh, we have a relative measurement and we have a percentage of the relative measurement, which is just outputting our percentage directly, which will make this easy. So now we'll go to 50. And we'll back this down. Fifty. I reset the meter because I went way too low for that range. Relative. <laughs> All right, so we're going to relative math uncheck auto zero. All right, so we have our 50. So let's go to 50 megahertz. All right, 99.5. We'll slowly spin this up to 100. I'm liking that. It's staying nice and stable. I'm rotating it up. I'm at 78. We're at 85. 89. There's 100. So we are within 1% of the reading at 100. So uh, from 50 to 100. So that's perfect. And now we need to be within 3%. So we will reset our metrics. All right, so we'll do no auto zero relative in math. Clear the buffer. Blow this up. And now we're going to go to... a hundred. Kick back. I am bumping the amplitude setting, which is causing it to go crazy. So let's put relative no auto zero in math back up. Now we're going to go to 100. There we go. Now we'll slowly wind this up to 250. There's 115, 125, 140, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 200, 220, 230, 40, and 250. So we are good. We are well within the 1% and 3% that it's looking for. And they want me to check uh, 0 0.25 to 50 now.
Let me get that set up. Because I'm doing this directly on the meter, I am just arbitrarily setting it to one volt. That range is good. That range is fine. That range is fine. I'm on the 10 to 25 range now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 10 to 25. Oh, let me reset the meter. That one might have a problem. Nope, that one's fine. 25 by 50. All right, mm, let's reset this. Math relative. Twenty five by fifty. Twenty five by fifty range seems a little low. Ah, it's a little low at fifty. That's my problem. Relative math. Relative math. There we go. There it is. Okay, makes spec on the 25 by 50 range, but barely. Uh, it wants me to check a higher voltage, so I need an attenuator. I want me to check at 4.7. That one's fine. Yeah, that range is good. Yeah, that range is fine. Yeah, that's fine. Much more stable at a higher, at a higher range. On to the twenty five by fifty. Nope, bump the control. That's fine. Check it relative to fifty, and then we'll wind up on the highest range. Excellent, within a percent. So I am happy with that. Thanks for stopping by the lab, taking a look at this SG503. Let me know how we're doing. I do read all the comments and all the videos. I'd like to thank all the subscribers to the channel. I'd also like to thank all the Patreons who are helping make this channel a reality. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.